Hey everyone, welcome back. We're getting closer to the end of this series on this Skunk Works 107 build for Dorothy and Daryl. If you remember in the last video, we loaded the cylinders and the pistons and the heads. Well, in today's video, we're going to assemble the rocker boxes. I'm going to explain a little bit how the crankcase breather system works inside the head. And then I'm going to show you how to properly adjust push rods. So stick with us. one of the first place we want to start uh, anytime you change the springs to especially the type of springs that we use beehive springs is commonly isn't a problem and then on rocker boxes that were i believe around 2012 uh, there was a notch a cutout for to clear this spring retainer right here but we want to check the clearance it's very very common for me to pull an engine apart that's been done by others that's running this type of spring and I can see witness marks on the rocker box lower rocker box where that has been tapping up against uh, up up against the lower rocker box that retainer is so we're going to double check that so a neat little way to do this another little tech tip centering the rocker boxes all right now another common noise that I hear on twin cams if you'll notice this hole right here this is where your push rod comes through if you're running thicker push rods you can this you can see this rocker box can actually move around quite a bit and not be perfectly centered on the head and all too often i can pull one down and actually see witness marks on the push rod where it is tapping the inside of the rocker box here so the way that you can center that up oil pump alignment pins or tap it block alignment pins that were used back on the evos just so happens these are quarter 20 thread same as your crankcase breather housing bolts slide those in place and they are tapered so that will perfectly center your rocker box okay now what we want to do here is check the clearance in this area right here between the retainer and the lower rocker box and then since there is a little bit of a different clearance between the two i am going to mark these front and rear so let's jump in here we're going to be working on the front one here so we'll mark that with an f we're gonna take a, you can run anywhere, I mean, really a 50 thousandths uh, Allen wrench is a good way to do this or something a little thicker. It doesn't need to be much. You only need roughly 50 to 60 thousandths clearance in there. What I like to do is run it, is run the short edge of the Allen wrench on top of the spring and drag it around and see if it hits the rocker box. And yes, it does hit right there. Now let's run it around the other way. And we don't have 50 thousandths clearance. So I'm going to take my permanent marker and I'm going to draw a line right where that spring stops. All right, just inside the rocker box there. And that's going to tell me from that area down, I just need to clearance it a little bit. Okay, now let's do the same thing for the rear one. Most of the time, they, the, your, this one will not need as much clearancing as the other but again the rocker boxes remember these things are cast so there can be slag that's in there things like that that can actually actually hit and this one's tapping a little bit right there so we're uh we're gonna clearance both sides that one where the spring falls and you know, you can look down in there and of course you look, it looks like you've got enough room, but you really need about 50,000. Give you a little bit of room in there, not a bad idea.
are still a little tight. A little tight right there. Take a little more. We're fine on the exhaust there. Yep. There we go. This is probably a good opportunity to kind of start the explanation of how the crankcase breathing system works in these things, okay? We're going to be building from the box up, so I'll kind of have to come back, but I can't put the box down without you seeing this. So the crankcase pressure is developed inside the crankcase, of course, from either combustion pressure, bleeding past the rings, or just from the downstroke of the piston itself. It creates a positive pressure. That positive pressure vents right up through here through the pushrod tubes comes into the rocker box, then it goes underneath the crank breather element, which I'll show you here in a second, and it goes through an umbrella valve, which seals to prevent pressure from being sucked back in during the upstroke of the piston, and then will open as the piston's going down, creating positive pressure. So basically, it's a one-way valve, okay? Well, that pressure then goes through that filter element, or under the umbrella valve, through the filter element, through this hole here, and then passes through this channel out of your crank breather on the head, okay? Now, when you put your gaskets on, make sure if you see this area here, that's the area that's blocking off this channel. So make sure it goes that direction. It is possible to put them on that way. I have seen people do that. So just make sure when you look at the embossment on a gasket, it follows that channel. I'm gonna leave these a little loose for now because I want the gasket to be able to wiggle around a little bit when I start the other bolts in here. Now for Loctite. Most often, I see people use too much Loctite. The way I do it, and it's plenty. If you just look at the diameter of the, the bolt itself, just put a dab in that small area. You don't need to run it all the way up the threads, just at the base. And of course, like I said in the last video, I have already primed and cleaned these. I mentioned I use acetone. You can also, I ran them in a wire wheel to get all of the Loctite off and then went back with acetone and cleaned them. But you can use, uh, actually one, one of our commenters mentioned that uh, it would ask if brake clean would work. Yes, brake clean will work just as well. At this point, you can just make sure the gasket's centered, which it is in all the holes. Now you can tighten down on your alignment pins. And now we know the box is perfectly centered. But follow the torque sequence and work it down a little at a time until it's, it's snug with your hand and then we'll grab a torque wrench. Now you can remove these. Okay, now let's talk about torquing bolts properly. All right, now, neat little tech tip. Anytime, most of the time, you'll always see a range on fasteners, a torque range, okay? So for these particular fasteners, it is 120 to 168 inch pounds. All right, so what I've always done on fasteners is you take your range and you put it right in the middle as to where you would want to torque it down. 
The reason typically your lowest range that or the lowest number in the range that they give you for torque is what is required in order to seal the gasket. At the top of the range is typically where you'll begin to weaken stress or strip the threads. And I like to set it in the middle. The other reason I set it in the middle is to say, for example, you ever had to come back and check to make sure fasteners are torqued down. Well, so you don't break any Loctite loose, what you would want to do is set your torque wrench to the lowest value of the range. Then you can check each torque on each bolt and it, and it should at least be that. That way, if you were to set it in the middle or at the upper end, then you could potentially break your Loctite loose. No need to do that. So if we're going to put it in the middle, we're going to go 144 inch pounds, which is 12 foot pounds. funny I like to test myself sometimes I know that with this palm ratchet on these bolts me giving it what I've got right here comes out to be about nine foot pounds typically so we're gonna test myself and see if we are in fact at about nine foot pounds all right so let's set the torque wrench Actually, let's set it to eight and see if the bolt turns. Nope, it clicked. So now let's go to nine and see if it turns. Nope, it clicked. Now let's go to 10 foot pounds and see if it moves. Oh, we're right at 10. Let's go to 11. Yep, and it moved. So we're within about one foot pound of that. That's pretty, <laughs> pretty funny. Perfect. All right, now let's move to, let's move to the rocker supports. I always like to assemble these before they go in the engine. I wanna check everything, make sure they're not cracked. I've already done all that and check everything. And Pull this apart. Now, when you check these, again, you guys aren't going to have dial bore gauges to check these bushings. So I'm going to tell you what it's supposed to feel like. Uh, I do have dial bore gauges. These bushings are actually in fantastic shape. They've got a great cross hatch on them. Uh, you can see a little wear on this rocker shaft, but it's visual. I can't feel it at all. And when I measured it, we're still well within, within clearance. The other thing I checked was that the rocker shaft does fit tight within the support here and here, which is perfect. When I took the engine apart, I also checked the axial play of the rocker arm to verify the clearance between the rocker arm and the support plate and found that to be tight actually well within tolerance so this should be a very quiet running top end there's no need to do anything else but we do want to use a generous amount of assembly lube and also you want to make sure you, when you clean these out make sure to pressurize the inside because you have an oil squirter right here that feeds oil to the valve stem then you also have this feeding oil uh, to the, the the push rod comes through there so check the pocket and make sure nothing looks strange or out of place. We want to put assembly lube on these areas because they do contact the aluminum on the rocker support. And then we'll also lube the rocker shaft. Perfect, nice tight fit. Now I did mention I should I would explain what these are supposed to feel like, the shafts inside the rocker. Just like the other pieces that I mentioned, like the wrist pins inside the wrist pin bushings in the connecting rod, it should be what's called a slip fit no shake. So when this is dry and clean, 
slide the shaft in and see if there's any movement or play in the rocker on the shaft. It All right, now let's put a little bit of assembly lube on our valve tips there. Grab our rocker bolts. We'll go ahead and lock tight them. You also need the O-ring. There's an O-ring that goes right under there. A little bit of oil on that. I still have oil on my fingers. We're gonna slide that o-ring right there all right verify your rocker arms are they feel nice there's no binding always double check that o-ring make sure it's there it cannot be pinched uh, if it does you'll end up getting quite a bit of blow by out of it Now the torque procedure for this is going to be different than if you were running uh, solid push rods. We are running adjustable push rods. If you were running solid push rods, you would want to make sure that this cylinder is on TDC of the compression stroke, which is when both, both valves are closed at the same time. Your push rods, of course, would, would have to be in place. And, and then you would want to walk this down very slowly, a little at a time, feeling the push rod each time, work it down slow to give the lifter time to bleed down so valve doesn't hit a, hit a valve. All right, now the torque range on these is 18 to 22 foot-pounds. As I mentioned before, we're gonna shoot for the middle of the range and we're gonna go to 20 foot-pounds. And now for the breather assemblies. Okay, in a twin cam, the breather assemblies consist of all these pieces you see laid out here. A minute ago, I had mentioned how the breather works. It vents through the positive crankcase pressure, will vent up the pushrod tubes through the head, through that channel, and then out of the head. But it goes through this component first. All right, of course, you have gaskets for the three different layers. This would be a gasket, your base layer, and then you would have this gasket, and you have that. But in between, you have an umbrella valve, all right? And you also have a breather element. So let's put these together real quick, and I'll explain exactly how they work. So you see the, the small holes in this area here. This breather valve is, again, a one-way valve, all right? Then you have this element, which to a large degree is what separates the oil and the air and allows it to drip back into the rocker box and then return to the crankcase to your oil pump and eventually back to the oil pan. So that air that's coming up from the pushrod tubes into the rocker box, that positive pressure coming up through here opens this umbrella valve and that allows that air to go through here, which then goes through this hole here and back down into the head so it's a, a you know it needs to be vented well and circulated well and then those small holes right there the oil that this filter element collects drains that little bit of mist back down into the crankcase
And these are 90 to 120 inch pounds. So we're gonna go to 105 inch pounds, split it down the middle. Okay, now one thing I like to do with these, of course, these are wedge shaped, right? And it always aggravates me when I see the rocker cover, you know, slid all the way down and crammed down. Sometimes it's hard to avoid, but we're gonna do everything we can to keep from avoiding that. Now I will say gems, that's another cool tool that they make. They actually make two alignment pins that go in here that are tapered to force the rocker box in place while you torque the bolts around it pretty cool piece unfortunately they're on back order right now well a lot of people like them i guess but uh i'll show you guys some of those uh the second that they that they come in what i've always done is just start it with the torque sequence and push to one side and start to walk it down slow and if we do that then the gasket will start to grab that cover and hold it in place I love this stand <laughs> okay let's talk push rod adjustments but uh, you want to make sure that you are on top dead center of the compression stroke when you are on top dead center of the compression stroke then uh, that's when you know both valves are on the seat and fully closed okay so you can actually be 180 degrees out because remember you can't put your thumb over the spark plug hole and turn the engine over the valves aren't going to open so you're going to have pressure with the piston coming up regardless of what stroke you're on be it the compression top of the compression stroke or the top of the exhaust stroke so here's a quick easy way of how you know which stroke you're actually on one thing get yourself a straw what we're going to do is come back here on the engine and we're going to turn it over until we know the piston is at tdc Again, there's, it's pointless for me to put my finger over the hole because it's going to make pressure. The valves are open, okay? Or excuse me, the valves are closed all the way. So I'm just going to feel in here and we're going to feel the piston and wait for it to get all the way at top dead center and stop moving back down. I verified I'm there. Let's go back the other way just to make sure I'm at TDC. Okay, now when you are at TDC compression stroke on the cylinder, both valves or both lifters should be all the way down. If I reach my finger in here and I can feel the top of the lifter is basically level with the roll pin that's in there. Okay, now let's go 180 degrees, bring the piston back up and I'll show you the difference. So we're gonna let it drop down. We'll bring it back through and we'll get it right at TDC. But this is going to be TDC of the exhaust stroke, which means one of our lifters is above the roll pin. The lifters have started moving. Now, one way that you can verify that if you put both your fingers down here and on the lifters and turn the engine just a little bit you'll feel the lifters moving if you feel the lifters moving you are on tdc of the exhaust stroke not tdc of the compression stroke so when you rotate the engine if you're at tdc 
If you just want to make sure, put your fingers on top of the lifters and turn the engine a little bit. You should not feel the lifters move. That tells you TDC of the compression stroke. So what we're going to do, I can put my finger on the lifters and I can spin the engine over, feel the lifters moving. I can feel that one coming up. As long as it's coming up, I know I'm getting or going back down. I know I'm getting pretty close. I'm going to put this here and I'm going to rotate around bring this back up wait for the straw to stop moving and it stops moving right there I can come over here and feel the lifters and the lifters are all the way down and the top of them is pretty much level with the roll pin now I know again I am on TDC of the compression stroke now we can put our push rods in all right but before we put the push rods in there's a couple things I want to review with you on this particular build, we are using SNS push rods. Now, there are some manufacturers, even though these are adjustable, easy install, etc., and that's another thing you need to look at. Some push rods are adjustable, but not easy install, which means they can't be put in without removing the, the tappet covers. All right. So, if you're using an easy install push rod, which is what we're using here, but these are SNS ones. All right, so several differences across manufacturers. First thing you want to do before you even start, they're uh, like Andrews, for example, their intake push rod is slightly shorter than their exhaust push rods. All right, well, SNS push rods, they're the exact same length. So you always, before you slide them in, even though they are adjustable, you want to make sure that uh, they're the same length. If not, your intake push rod is always the shorter of the two. All right, now, of course, we're going to put our o-rings in and i'll use a little bit of assembly lube on them just makes it easier to slide the push rod into place or the push rod tube and i'll give you another little tidbit of information if you're not using uh, like harley's o-rings uh, for the upper is always yellow all right now there's an obvious size difference between the two but the o-rings that go inside the head which would be yellow for using stock harley ones are the exact same o-ring that is used on the oil pump to case so that's the reason you would have five of those o-rings in the kit and always slide when you slide the o-ring in there always slide your finger through the the hole for the push rod to make sure the the o-ring isn't pressed into the rocker box or into the rocker housing one thing i want to show you on these your push rod tubes i you'd be surprised how often i see these assembled incorrectly so let me show you how these are supposed to be assembled this collar goes on first then the spring then this washer then the o-ring all right and you want to put a little bit of assembly lube on these as well it just makes it makes it easier to uh, slide them up once they're once they're under tension it doesn't take much just a just a little bit then we can just pick one slide that in there we're going to start with the intake i'm going to put a little bit of assembly lube on top of the lifter a little bit on top of the push rod i've already checked these always look down the push rod make sure there's nothing in there any machining slag or anything like that i've already cleaned these i know it is it's also a good idea if you're reusing push rods to actually blow through it make sure everything's everything is nice and clean now the another common question that i see quite frequently on push rod adjustment is how many turns well and people seem to want to ask the push rod manufacturer it's really not up to the push rod manufacturer it's up to whoever manufactures your lifters okay lifters have most lifters anyway if they don't have travel limiters in it or they're not hydrosolids uh, your your lifters are going to have two hundred thousandths of an inch total travel on the plunger okay most lifter manufacturers again i say most check yours and they want that plunger to be half of lifter travel so that's going to be 100 thousandths of an inch down. So you have 200 thousandths total travel. They want it to be in the middle at 100 thousandths. So there's a real easy way to know how many turns on your push rod. Different manufacturers have different thread pitches on their adjusters. 
Andrews, for example, is a 32 thread per inch. Okay, Andrews, they're typical chromoly push rods. They're also 32, but some most of the Screaming Eagle push rods will be 24. Okay, well, the SNS push rods are 32 threads per inch. All right, so the way that I know that I want that lifter halfway down at 100 thou is I take my thread per inch count of the push rod and divide it by 10. So if I had a 24 thread per inch push rod, I would divide that by 10, that gives me 2.4. That's telling me roughly 2.4 turns will get me 100 thousandths down of lifter tr of plunger travel. These are 32 thread per inch, so I'm gonna put them at three and a quarter turns down. On uh, uh, three and a quarter turns, 32 threads per inch, 32 divided by 10, 3.2 turns, that puts me there, all right? So the trick to this is clap the push rod as much as you need to. Slide that in on the intake side. You can see we can't get it in there. The reason I didn't do this, normally when I build an engine, what I'll actually do before I put the rocker support in and the rocker arm, I will actually drop the push rods in place. I didn't do it then because I thought you may want to see how to install these, say if you're doing a cam chest. So that's the reason we did it this way. So I collapsed this all the way and let's check our O-ring. Make sure we haven't pushed it in. We want to feel that it's seated inside the rocker. And we're gonna drop that down into the lifter and start threading it out. Okay, another little trick, redneck tool. No offense to the rednecks. Get yourself a rubber band with a little hook on it. Bring that right there. That'll hold your push rod tube up. All right, I'm gonna tell you another little trick too on installing these. So the SNS push rods have this nut. That nut can, you know, drop down and as you're extending the push rod, then it makes it tough to get that nut back out. All right, so if you'll take, you'll take a wrench, a quarter inch, and slide it on that shaft right there and put the nut on top of it. That way it won't drop down. Now you can expand the push rod a lot easier. Okay, at this point, once you have some thread showing, you can kind of start that retainer nut there, the lock nut, so you don't have to deal with it quite as much. All right, let the push rod drop down. You can feel that it's up there in the rocker. Put your quarter inch back on here, and you want to loosen or expand this push rod to the point that you have zero lash. And it doesn't take very much pressure. So let's say I'll back this off a little bit you can see I have a little bit of up and down movement, okay? I'm gonna very gently spin this until there's slight resistance and no more up and down movement. If you spin this too hard, you will begin to collapse the plunger in the lifter, then your adjustment will be off. It'll be too far down. So I want just enough resistance, just barely between two fingers, that there's tension, and if I move the push rod, there is absolutely zero up and down movement. That is basically zero lash. And if you need to do it a couple of times, that's fine to get a good feel for it. And then go right back to that spot right there and you'll feel that resistance. This is the other reason why I pump up the lifters as I showed in the previous video. I pump that up to make sure there's some pressure behind that to make it a little easier for me to identify exactly where that zero lash point is. And you can see now I have no up and down movement. Believe it, the best thing for this is one of these metallic silver Sharpie markers. I like to make a little dot straight toward me. All right, now let's grab a wrench. All right, it's a 7 16 Once you put this wrench in place here, do not move the quarter inch wrench. All right, we have zero lash, we've confirmed it. Now we're gonna count our revolutions of that mark. Do not allow the bottom section to turn. This is where things get a little bit tricky and people can have a hard time doing this. You're gonna need two 7 16 wrenches. You want this one in place to keep the bottom from turning. You want this one on the top and also hold them both firmly so neither one of them turn. Now you can lock your lock nut. Now, 
Now, before we install the exhaust, we want to wait until I can spin this push rod by hand easily. All right. On some lifters, if it's a really, really good lifter, it's been run for a little while, that sort of thing, then uh, it can sometimes take five, 10 minutes or longer before you would be able to spin this push rod. All right, so this one, we can, we can spin it. So I know the valve is closed all the way. We're good to go. Now, the other thing you can do is also look inside the port on both and make sure the valve is seated all the way. But I can spin it pretty easily. Let's move on to the next one. All right, put the lower in place. Let's go ahead and put the clip in before I do that. Let's get that in place. Let's take this. Now you wanna be very careful going up with your upper push rod tube because you can grab that O-ring and curl it and we don't wanna do that. So we're gonna hold the bottom in place and we're gonna look up in there and it should slide in there and almost snap into the O-ring. Boom, just like that. All right, so now we're fully seated. Now, let me show you another really trick tool from Jim's. There's a couple of companies that make these things. But uh, as always, as always, Jim's machine <laughs> seems to make stuff even better in the tool side of things. So this is their push rod clip installer. Pretty trick little deal. Put the clip in here just like this. And we're gonna get it up into the head. Clip it onto the collar. and then push it down into place. That is the easiest way I have ever seen to put these things on with. Of course, there's a little notch in there. You can use a screwdriver, and sometimes you gotta bat a little bit, but that is trick and easy. I also like to take a screwdriver, go right to the top of the clip and give it a little bump. Make sure it's seated all the way. Make sure it's seated all the way there. And we're golden. A little bit of resistance right there. Let's put our clip on. Mark our push rod. Quarter inch wrench. Do not turn the quarter inch. Hold it firmly where it is. And let's do our turns. All right, we've waited until we can spin the push rod. We're good to go. Let's pop that down there sure the o-ring's in place bring this up grab our screwdriver slide that in there easy and it will snap boom, right into the o-ring and i'll show you how to use this again the other thing this little deal right there is great to put under there and also when you have the little loops just to slide it under there and pop the clip off kind of a neat little deal so anyway, you got this slot in here, slide your clip in there just like that, right? Got in there all the way. Let's go up inside, clip it onto the collar and just twist her down. Pops it right into place. Sweet. Take your screwdriver, tap it in at the top. Make sure you're in all the way. Tap it down here at the bottom. And you're good to go. Nice. Since we've already checked both push rods, we are now free to spin the engine over to TDC on the front. All right. Again, make sure you can spin the push rods. If you spin this engine over while the valves are off the seat, the valve can hit the piston, the valve can hit a valve. We don't want that to happen. All right. So again, let's grab our straw. Come back over here. And let's get the piston up to TDC. We are at the top. Now let's see if our lifters are all the way down. And they are. If you're not sure, put your finger on the lifters, spin the engine slightly, and you should not feel the lifters move. And our last clip.
And when we finish an engine build, I buy this stuff by the gallon, which is why it's in this bottle. Uh, engine works from Clockworks. Spray it down, make everything look nice. We're not quite done yet. This is gonna slide back into its home in that 2007 Ultra Classic. And from there, we'll be doing the primary, putting in a billet clutch basket and a clutch. Then we'll also be putting in a compensating sprocket. We're gonna do some suspension work on it as well. And uh, then they'll be ready to ride here shortly. Following this one, we have the exact same process we're doing on EM8. We've got several underway right now. We've got one for one of our channel members, Larry Terrell, a number, another for a, a channel member, Gerald Ward. We're doing one for Gerald. Then we've got uh, Stephen. We're doing his. His is going to be quite an incredible build front to back, so we're excited about that one as well. So again, we're going to take you guys along the step, uh, step by step, along the entire process of these builds. If you're interested in joining the channel, if you click a link in the description below, uh, you'll see one for membership. You'll also see a, a link popping up here somewhere for uh, the rest of the videos in this build series. Take a look at that. Lastly, I'm going to post a link uh, for Gems USA where you can see more about the tools that we use when we build an engine like this. They do make fantastic tools. Thanks again for watching, guys. Take care of yourselves and each other. Have a good one.